<laughs> Alright, so I guess I can talk about Brittany's point while we wait for questions. Which equations are on this test? Um, that kind of depends on... Yes, exactly. Uh, so that kind of depends on what you classify as equations. Um, I mean, of course, for sure, there is an equation that we'll, we'll want. Um, that's definitely an important one to have there. Um, some people consider this an equation. Uh, so that one would be important there. Um, if you consider molar mass an equation as well. I mean... All of these are just conversion factors, honestly. So it's uh, it just depends if you view them as equations. So um, in terms of like these ones, you'll want to know. I mean, these are I guess the three like major ways. Notice that these are all ways to get moles of something, uh, and that's what we're doing in in like the last couple lessons, right? Um, let's see. I don't know if you consider this an equation, but like, I mean, <laughs> like the sum of all oxidation numbers is zero. Um, adding in, let's see. I mean, this would be the stuff that's that's being put there, right? So uh, all like these three equations could be ones that we could use for stoichiometry. Yeah, exactly. So unless it's like a, um, if it's not a compound, if it's an ion, all right. And I, again, I'm not sure if you want to consider these equations, but technically, yes, they're. I mean, <laughs> you could say, you know, for CO two, it's you know carbon plus two oxygens equals zero, and you know you could go from there. So um, technically, an equation. But yeah, so, but technically, like, the, the big one that's an actual equation, for sure, the gas law, ideal gas law. Um, and then these, these ones are also um, going to be an important bit for our, yeah, exactly, you should get plus four and minus two. Yeah. I'm awesome. I'm glad that you uh, did it. And I hear Sabrina has uh, reached out to you guys as well. So uh, that's good to hear. So good to see the groups are coming together. Alrighty, so uh, I think Lamanda is coming up with some questions. Um, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, so um, I think your your second sentence there, Brittany, is um, is fine. Yeah, so it's kind of you know if we uh, go back to our big old chart, uh, we'll save this for now. Um, if we go to our giant chart. So long as you know you can use this, um, technically those are your like three equations there. Uh, so you saw molar mass, the molarity, and then the ideal gas law. Um, so, so there we go. So um, if you can, uh, you know, use these three equations to figure out any of these, um, then you should be okay. And I think the homework has a variety of problems like this. Again, I, I don't think I had covered every single possibility, but um, you should have enough in there to uh, to kind of really understand uh, what's you know how to use uh, all of these three. Okay, so it looks like we've got. Hoo hoo hoo. Okay, so Lamanda has some redox stuff. Let's go ahead and look at that. So let's see. Um, why don't we do a homework problem? 
Um, Lamonda, if you want, go ahead and just choose a problem from the homework. And let's do the Redox stuff for it together. Uh, let me see here. Let me open it up. Yeah, there it is. So um, because, uh, like, so you can choose any of the ones from problem four um, that I've asked you to do Redox stuff for, or you can really choose any of the other uh, equations there. Okay, so while you're choosing a question to go over, Lamanda, um, you do not always need to do a net ionic equation first. That may help you, um, it may not. So for something like a combustion reaction, for example, um, I can fix this, yeah. This one is a redox reaction, but there would be no net ionic equation because there's no ions here. Um, so there's um, nothing as aqueous. These would all be gases. Um, so you would not be able to do a net ionic equation. So it's not necessary to do a net ionic equation to figure out redox stuff. For something like a single replacement, it makes it easy for you to do uh, if you do the net ionic equation first. But that may just take time from you that you um, should probably save for other things. Um, and yes, you... Oh, okay. Well, you, you can just... Type, oh, I guess she's... I can't talk to her while she's logged out. Okay. Let me type it for her. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so she's going to choose that. In the meantime, yeah. So, um, and just to put it out there, you do not need to balance the equation in order to do redox stuff. Um, we could do it completely as is. We do not need to balance. We do not need to find the coefficient of oxygen or anything. None of that changes your, um, uh, your equation. So, um, you know, technically, if we balance this, Let's see, it'll just be like that, right? So 2H2O, this just means you have two of these. Each one of them, you're gonna have the same oxidation numbers. So having the balancing there doesn't change any oxidation numbers at all. So uh, it really does not, um, it's kind of a waste of time if you want to balance the equation if you're just asked for redox stuff. So uh, that that should be something. <laughs> Sorry, Lavanda. I don't know why. Maybe, um, I don't know. <laughs> I have never been kicked out of Twitch, so I don't know. Maybe uh, someone else in your house is uh, logging on. Who knows? So uh, it doesn't matter how many you have, but yeah, Lamanda, point here, do not worry about balancing if you're just doing redox stuff. So uh, why don't you go ahead and choose a, a question from the homework. Uh, I can pull it up here if we want to see it. Um, if we want to take a look at this, um, let's go ahead and uh, choose one of these from number four and we can do the redox stuff for it. We can look at the oxidation numbers for all of the elements or rather uh, compounds or elements. Uh, and then we can look at uh, agents and stuff too. And so Lamanda, you get the, uh, the choice here of which one you'd like us to do. on A. Ah, so A is not a double displacement reaction. Um, it's kind of not one of our, a double displacement reaction is always 
two ionic compounds coming together. So, uh, okay, so let, let me uh, go ahead and switch the window back here. So double displacement are always two ionic compounds together. So this one we have, um, was it NaOH plus aluminum? So technically this is closer to a single replacement than it is a double displacement because we have a compound and an element. Though this one is kind of a special case because uh, sodium can't really exist in water um, because it will react with it immediately. So um, this one is telling us we get, uh, was it aluminum um, hydroxide or oxide? Okay. Okay. So of course I would not ask you to um, figure out the products of this one because I'm only asking you to figure out products for one of our five, you know, standard reactions here. So um, while this one is more of a single replacement, um, you might be, you know, tempted to say, okay, we're going to get aluminum hydroxide and sodium, but um, this is not something I would give you as a single replacement anyway, so let's not worry about that. Okay, anyways, let's take a look at this. So for redox stuff, uh, we're going to want to look at each kind of substance in this reaction, and we're going to want to figure out the um, oxidation numbers for all of these. So let's go ahead and just go left to right here. Um, we should see two of these right away are elements. And remember, elements always have uh, an oxidation number of zero. So these two, we already know, should be zero. Aluminum by itself and hydrogen by itself. So any element by itself should be zero. So now we've got to look at all of the other ones. So the first compound here, the sodium hydroxide, is perhaps the uh, most difficult of these ones because uh, it is a, it has a complex ion in it. So we don't have uh, all simple ions here. So this tells us we need to make sure everything equals to zero because it's a compound. We know that sodium in this is a simple ion. And then we have oxygen and hydrogen left. So we'll want to go back to our rules, and uh, the rules uh, give us hydrogen before they give us oxygen. So we're going to have hydrogen as plus one. And so we're going to see two plus oxygen equals zero, so oxygen equals negative two, which is kind of normal anyway. We would expect that uh, in most situations. Great. Yeah, perfect, Brittany. So uh, if we then go ahead and look at the other compounds, uh, we see these are all uh, just ionic compounds. So they're going to go with the charges uh, of those particular ions. So we know aluminum in ionic compounds is plus 3, oxygen is minus 2 for simple ions, and sodium oxide we're going to see a uh, similar pattern there. So sodium hydroxide is the only one we really had to kind of calculate something for. Okay, well, let's go ahead and now look at all of these and see what is happening here. So sodium, oxygen, hydrogen, aluminum. Let's take a look at all of these. So sodium is going from plus 1 to plus 1. Oxygen is going from minus 2 to minus 2. Hydrogen is going from plus 1 to 0 and aluminum is going from 0 to plus 3. So we see here we have 2 changing. Remember, we always have to have uh, something changing for it to be a redox reaction. So we already know this is a redox reaction. And we see that hydrogen is going from plus 1 to 0. And aluminum is going from 0 to plus 3. So hydrogen's oxidation number is getting smaller. Yes, Ashley, we can do that. 
So hydrogen is being reduced. Aluminum is becoming more positive. It's losing electrons. So that one is going to be oxidized. And so now we want to go up. We're going to see which compound in the... Yeah, exactly, Kenji. We're going to look at our reactants and see which one of these has hydrogen in it. And it looks like that's NaOH. So that tells us that NaOH is the oxidizing agent. It is the compound in the reactant that contains the element that is reduced. remember that they kind of just go switch so the one that is reduced is the oxidizing agent right and then the other one we have to look at what's containing aluminum it looks like aluminum is just by itself so we can go ahead and say aluminum is our reducing agent So this blob would be your kind of answer here. Uh, and all this stuff up here would be like work done. Of course, you don't have to like actually write out something like sodium hydroxide like this. You know, I can trust you can do that sort of algebra. But uh, if you have something that's more complicated, it would be beneficial to do your work there. Um, so before we do that, Ashley, I want to do one more um, redox one first. Let me uh, let's choose something that has only molecular compounds just to make it a little bit more troublesome. Okay, how about we do the second one as well? Any questions on that one, by the way? I really should have kept this window open. I don't know why I closed it. Let's see. Okay, NH or N2H4, hydrazine plus hydrogen peroxide turns into nitrogen and water. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at the oxidation numbers for this one. So right away we have one that we can do. Nitrogen is by itself, so it should be zero. Easy. One down, three to go. We've done water a number of times. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and put that in there. Uh, water we've done so many times by now. Uh, water should have plus one and minus two as its oxidation numbers. So the other ones we're going to want to go ahead and uh, calculate for. So we have um, two nitrogens plus four hydrogens equals zero. We have a rule for hydrogen before nitrogen. So let's go ahead and uh, substitute the plus one in for hydrogen. We get 2n equals minus 2. I'm sorry, minus 4, and therefore n is minus 2. So remember, you always want to do these in order. So we had a rule for fluorine, then hydrogen, then oxygen, and then we follow electronegativity rules. So um, even though uh, you know, nitrogen prefers a different charge, it doesn't matter. We have to follow the rules that are given to us. So hydrogen is plus one, nitrogen is minus two. Right, the next one we have is hydrogen peroxide. Uh, again, hydrogen comes first in our priorities as plus one. And so in this case, oxygen will be minus one.
All right, any questions on any of those oxidation numbers before we look at uh, what's changing here? What elements do we have? Nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay. So nitrogen started as minus two, became zero. Hydrogen is plus one on all of these. I'll just include both of the different hydrogens we had. Oxygen went from minus one to minus two. This is our reactants and products, of course. So if nitrogen is, <laughs> when you read them, this one's just asking you to do oxidation numbers and stuff. <laughs> well, uh, you'll have three more to work on, so it's exactly the same thing we're doing uh, here. So uh, if we look at nitrogen, uh, that one is being oxidized, right? Its number is increasing. Oxygen is therefore being reduced. Uh, its number is going down. So it's being reduced, it's gaining electrons. Uh, and so let's go ahead and look at our agents here. So if, if nitrogen is being oxidized, that tells us that hydrazine there, N2H4, is the reducing agent. And since oxygen is being reduced, it's going to mean that hydrogen peroxide is going to be our oxidizing agent. Okay, so let's, I'll leave that up for a second. Yeah, yeah, so all of these would, it's all the same process. So for the next ones, you would say, you know, six hydrogen plus six carbon equals zero and blah, 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 and then calculate for carbon. For, um, uh, you know, really all of these are processes exactly the same. So if you have simple ions, you can kind of work with those a little bit more easily. But technically, the process is the same. If we go up to that aluminum oxide one, you know, technically, we could say, yes, 2Al plus 3 oxygens equals 0, and we could solve for these. Um, not really necessary, since these are both simple ions. We already have their rules right away. Um, you know, so we don't really need to do this, but yeah. For hydrocarbons, it's exactly the same. So anything for oxidation numbers, this is the process you'll go through. So for uh, anything that doesn't have simple ions or isn't fully made of simple ions, you're going to have to do this little algebra bit here to calculate uh, what your the last element is. So um, ah, sneeze maybe. Let's see. Nope, not going to happen. Ah, that's the worst. Yeah, so hydrocarbons, same process. Correct. Double displacements are never redox reactions. So um, I think is one of yours. Uh, actually, all of those will be redox reactions. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's nice. Good. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and look at the um, states of matter. All right, so states of matter stuff. I'm going to start with the easiest and go down to the hardest ones. So easiest one is liquid. Uh, there are 
two things that will be liquid for us. There would be water or bromine. Ta-da! Uh, and these um, are all going to be from double displacement or single replacement reactions. For other types of reactions, you may not know what the states of matter are going to be, uh, simply because those reactions may need to take place at a high temperature. Like, for example, combustion, we're producing a lot of heat that is going to cause our water to be gaseous instead. But we're not going to worry about combustion. For double displacement or single replacement, that's what I'm going to be asking you the uh, states of matter for. So liquid, easy. Water or bromine, done. For gases, we have hydrogen sulfide is one of them. And then we also need to remember that if we produce one of these, if we produce one of these in a replacement reaction, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for, for a single replacement or double displacement, it's always a liquid. So other reactions, who knows, it could be whatever it wants. There were uh, three of these that we have to kind of split the water off of. And again, the water is going to be liquid. So your gases are going to be the ones that are underlined in blue here. So hydrogen sulfide would be a gas, uh, or ammonia, carbon dioxide, or sulfur, di sulfur dioxide. Um, and then let's just say, so remember that uh, this one should be um, liquid, right? So liquids will be purple, and then your gases will be the blue ones. All right, so those two states are the easier ones. Let's go to the hard ones then. <laughs> So aqueous is next, um, and this is going to be the stuff that is soluble, right? So these are going to be your soluble ionic compounds if at least one reactant is aqueous. And then, of course, your acids are also aqueous. So you kind of have two things that could be aqueous here. OK, so solubility rules. Let's just do those one more time. So I, I think, Ashley, you use a chart, which is totally cool. You can totally use a chart for this. Um, but I'll just uh, reiterate the rules that I use. So. Um, Anything that has our group one ions or ammonium or acetate or nitrate will be soluble. Anything that has any of those. So always will be soluble. Let's make the nitrate a little bit nicer here. Two, we have our halides, which are chloride, bromide, iodide. But remember, there are three exceptions here. Sodium, I'm sorry, sodium, silver, uh, lead, and uh, mercury. So that tells us so for example uh, these would all be solid compounds but something like cobalt chloride should be aqueous 
or um, I don't know how about aluminum iodide would also be aqueous you know whatever everything else that has these uh, halides should be soluble Okay, and the last one we have is sulfates. So that is going to be anything with the sulfate ion will be soluble, except, we have a lot of exceptions here, calcium, strontium, barium, and then we also have the same three ions from before. So we would expect something like iron 2 sulfate would be soluble, but lead 2 sulfate would be solid. Okay, or let's see, how about chromium 3 sulfate would also be soluble but not barium sulfate or calcium sulfate or whatever. So um, that's how the exceptions work. And then we assume we assume everything else is insoluble. All right, so anything that's not covered by these rules, we would expect to be insoluble. And so those will be our solids. All right, one more thing to note. Elements by themselves are typically solid. Uh, your periodic table should show you which ones are which state of matter. But uh, for liquid, we only have, what did I just say? Oh, that works. The only elements that are liquids would be mercury and bromine. Ones that are gases would be hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, all our halogen, oh, I guess I can't say that, it's only going to be fluorine and chlorine. And all of our noble gases. And then all other elements are solid. All right, so no element is aqueous. Uh, unless you're like forcing it to be like you could force one of these gases to become aqueous. But by and large, elements are going to be uh, not uh, aqueous. So, for example, like aluminum metal, you know, does not dissolve in water. Right. If you take a piece of aluminum foil and put it in water, it doesn't just dissolve, you know, or worse, if you're cooking with aluminum pots and pans, you know, those don't dissolve while you're cooking. That would be a giant mess. Right, so um, uh, that's the only thing. Uh, again, your, your periodic table should show you um, the state of matter for all the elements by themselves, um, but technically there you go. So why don't we maybe do a, um, let's do two problems from the homework. Okay, how about we do, how about we do 6a? So that's telling us aqueous sodium sulfide and hydrochloric acid are being mixed together. So again, we're going to need to translate from the um, 
names to formulas. So you thought you could forget your naming rules, but no. What is the formula for sodium or did I say sodium sulfide? Yeah. So let's go ahead and translate these into formulas. Can you hear Creature making his sounds from under the desk? These are the word problems. <laughs> There's four words, Kenji. <laughs> I thought you meant word problems like, let's have a look at the rest of the homework here. Uh, something like seven or really seven through 12, I would expect those to be um, uh, okay. Sounds good, Lamanda. All right, so what, what is sulfide? Hopefully we also know by now that hydrochloric acid is HCl. But uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, not quite, Kenji. Why? Why is that not quite right? Mm-hmm. Indeed. Don't forget to charge balance. So, okay, so this has said that the sodium sulfide is aqueous. Uh, and of course, hydrochloric acid should be aqueous as well. Yes, don't forget to charge balance. So what type of uh, reaction is this going to be? Aha, uh -huh. this is indeed a double displacement. Yep. We have two ionic compounds that we're putting together. So, um, this tells us that it's a double displacement reaction. So, that means we're going to want to swap them. Indeed. So, NaCl is one of them. So that came from the ones in blue. So remembering that this is, so she has combined sodium and chloride. And so now we have to combine the other two what do we get when we mix these two? Exactly, yeah. All right, so now let's uh, go back and look at our uh, states of matter. Exactly, Brittany, yeah. So if we look at our states of matter, we have sodium chloride as the first one. So let's go ahead and check our solubility rules. Aha, uh -huh. look, anything with sodium should be soluble. We also know anything with chloride should be soluble. So for sure, um, sodium chloride should be soluble. 
and therefore aqueous. We know that because um, we have at least one reactant that is aqueous, so we have water around there. H2S, though, uh, remember, is one of our... Where did it go? Aha! That one there is one of our gases. So uh, remember, we're going to have four gases. H2S is one of them. So um, that's one that you'll just need to know uh, typically will form a gas. That's your nasty um, sulfury, you know, uh, rotten egg smell is H2S. So we know it's a gas because it goes right up our nose and we think it's gross. So this one should be a gas. Indeed. So for net ionic, you split aqueous stuff. Anything that's solid liquid gas, keep it together. So you will see that sodium and chloride are spectator ions. So your net ionic equation is just going to be two hydrogen ions plus the sulfide ion turning into H2S gas. Hooray! But I'll let you deal with that just so we can do uh, another one. We can do the one that Lamanda did ask for, which was... One A. So yeah, you guys can do the net ionic stuff on your own. Let's just work on states of matter right now. So we have sodium bicarbonate. Plus oxalic acid. So again, all comes down to remembering your naming rules, yes? What's the bicarbonate ion? Mm-hmm. Don't forget the charge, though. Minus one. All right. Oxalic acid. Let's see what that's going to be. So it has the ending ic acid. Remember that ic acid means eight, right? Uh, so the, the suffix ic acid comes from something that ends in eight. So we're looking for oxalate. And so what's the formula for oxalate? Indeed. And that has a two minus. So let's go ahead and charge balance these. Once you do so, And I believe I said this was aqueous to start. And then our oxalic acid is aqueous as well. So let's see what the heck we get here. So let's go ahead and uh, just write our ions again, even though they're written right there. Well, poor Oz is having his tracheal collapse down there. So we're going to want to, oops, we're going to want to put these two together. 
and these two together. So if we do the light blue one, we should get sodium oxalate. I have completely run out of room as always. Putting the green one together, we have uh, carbonic acid. So let's go ahead and look at our um, states of matter again. Sodium oxalate, let's go ahead and check where that would be. So let's check our uh, rules for ionic compounds. Aha, looks like it has sodium in it, so it's going to be soluble. Easy. And now let's go look. Carbonic acid, can we just leave that as aqueous? Hmm, we cannot because carbonic acid is one of our special ones exactly we have to break it apart so uh we're gonna instead instead of writing carbonic acid as our product we're gonna write the carbon dioxide and water so we're gonna cross that guy out and we're gonna write carbon dioxide plus water So again, the, the gas ones, you're just going to kind of want to need to remember to keep an eye out. So um, carbonic acid will immediately break down into CO2 and water. And so... Uh, Lamanda, you would want to keep carbon dioxide and water together uh, as uh, in your net ionic equation. So don't break those guys up. What's the oxidizing agent for this uh, problem? Is that so? Hmm, how about we do it in purple? So Brittany says sodium. I say not applicable because it is a double displacement. Indeed. So there is no oxidizing agent. So Brittany, we're going to go ahead and say you really meant to put a slash in between N and A. So, yeah. So there's your trick question for the day. Of course, I couldn't just ask you like immediately like poof. Nope. If you really want to check, you will see no oxidation numbers change through the whole thing. I can tell you what they all are, in fact. I'll write them above. Yeah, plus four. Uh, so two minus eight, so these are going to be plus three. So you'll see, in fact, Yes, we can. <clears throat> uh, so you'll see, in fact, none of the oxidation numbers change. So the ox, uh, the carbon that's part of oxalate stays as plus three. The carbon that's part of carb bicarbonate turns into carbon dioxide, and that one 
Yes, we can do that, Kenji. Sure, no problem. So, yeah. What reaction did you have in mind of that, for that? Do you want me to make this nastily complex or easy? Just easy. Okay, fine. So, uh, how many moles of water will make? Okay. So trying to, uh, we can do an electrolysis reaction. So this is how they make hydrogen for your uh, hydrogen powered cars. Uh, if you apply electricity, you can get uh, water to break apart. So we're gonna want to balance this. Ta-da. All right, Kenji has even given us the problem. Oh, Kenji, this is too easy. This is too easy. <laughs> fair enough fair enough so you go ahead and do it then and then tell us what the answer is oh you already you did you already do it and you just want to kind of uh Okay, well, let me show you how I would do this problem. So you always start with what you have. We always have to put the unit we're getting rid of on the bottom. Uh, and we want to put what we're, what we want on the top. Uh, and so here we just have our reaction coefficients. Ta-da! So you would need 38.4 moles of water to uh, uh, figure that out. Sure, Lamanda, we can do that. Let me just see. Uh, Kenji, is this... Uh, we do the recipe way. Uh, what do you mean the recipe way? Do you mean like a limiting reactant type situation? Multiply the given number on their subscript. Frankly, Kenji, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. So, I mean, technically that's exactly what we're doing in this one. Um, are you just saying multiply by two because of, because of the coefficient? Because the subscript for oxygen would be this one. Uh, but a coefficient is the number in front. Ah, okay. Well, that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, so these are these are the coefficients, right? So, um... I mean, 
yeah, I guess it, it you're you could just do it that way, but that would only work if the coefficient is one for the other one. So um, I would not recommend doing it a different way for this one, just because if your coefficient were three, for example, um, you would need to make it three down here. Um, so, so the conversion way is, is not really different from what you're doing. It's just a way of um, making sure your units are correct. So, um, I mean, you're always free to do it however you want, but I would caution against just looking at the coefficient and multiplying it by two or something. Um, that is not a hard and fast rule that you can do. So it will work if you're, it will work in a very narrow situation. That will work if you have a coefficient of one for your other substance, and if you're given moles to start and you're asked for moles. So that's a very narrow question that you could apply that to. You're welcome to apply it to that. It would work, but just be aware that if your uh, equation or question is more complex, it will probably not work. Okay, so um, that's my um, advice there. So yeah, it would totally work in this situation. But again, if you found some other way to do all this stuff and you're getting the right answer, whatever, go ahead and do that. So <laughs> uh, you, you are not required at all to use uh, my methods for, for these things. So cool. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, Lamanda has asked about question eight. Let's have a look at question eight. Cool. All righty. So we have an equation. This is Kenji's favorite type of equation, in fact. And we're given delta H equals negative 3752.39 kilojoules per mole. Okay. And it's asked how much Uh, how much of this to produce 5,000 kilojoules? So remember that delta H is a conversion factor between moles and kilojoules. However, this equation is not balanced. The only thing you can get away with not balancing is uh, the redox stuff. So this is not redox stuff that we're asked to calculate. It is a redox reaction, but we're not asked that. Um, so we're going to have to balance the equation. So that's uh, really the, uh, the main part of this. And then we just throw in the delta H at the end. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to just move all this stuff away for now. Oh, how silly. I'm just going to get rid of it for right now. Okay. So let's go ahead and balance this monster. We have six carbons, 10 hydrogens, two oxygens. We have um, one carbon, two hydrogens, and three oxygens. Yes. So Lamanda, yeah, you've definitely got to balance it first. Yep. Because remember, delta H will be equal to the coefficient of your uh, substance. So um, do we want to do this where we're going to get fractions potentially, or do we want to just double it at the start? Which way do we want to balance this? Let me just try and do it in my head. Let's see, 12 plus one plus five. Oh, we don't need to double it. So yeah, so this one will work out without having to double it. So let's go ahead and just do our adjustments. If we do that, we make 12 plus one, 13 oxygens. 
if we try to make, oops, if we need to make the hydrogens 10, put a five there. So we in fact get, oh, we are gonna get a fraction, but oh well. Six times two, 12, five times uh, one is 17 total. So this will be 17 over two oxygens. So now we're gonna to wanna to double everything. I didn't double that. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. So yeah, you get 17 over 2 is your fraction. Um, yep, looks good, Kenji. Uh, except you've, you've, for some reason, um, put, split out the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you can't write, this is not the same thing. Don't ever write it like that. Those are different compounds. So um, don't um, ever kind of like distribute your coefficient in that manner. Yeah, yeah. So those are not the same. So keep it as 2C6H10. Okay, so that being the case, we know that delta H, uh, which was 3752.5, kilojoules. So that one is equal to two moles of C6H10, which is also equal to 17 moles of oxygen or 12 moles of CO2, same thing, or 10 moles of water. So your delta H, the number, is always equal to your coefficients uh, in your reaction. So. Let's go ahead and plug this in here. We have all this lovely stuff. So it looks like we're going to be using this, um, whatever compound, this could be hexine or something, but uh, we'll use this one. So we are going from kilojoules to moles to grams. So um, you would you know, start with your kilojoules that you're given. You'd put your kilojoules at the bottom. Um, by the way, this says produce that amount of energy. That means it's negative. Don't worry about the negative sign for these ones. Um, I'm only ever asking you for a magnitude uh, of these. So you're going to see if you take 111 um, that the sign will just tell you which way the energy is going. For us, it doesn't matter. You can ignore the negatives. Uh, it's just telling us, again, it's an exothermic reaction. But don't worry. You can never have a negative mass, so don't worry. Just make it positive. Okay, and then uh, we have our two moles of C6H10 at the top. You'd multiply this by your molar mass for one mole. And you'd get your answer. All right, so we have gone a little bit over, um, so we'll we'll finish up here. Um, that's how you would set that up. So you just have to remember to balance. Remember again, uh, the important thing here for delta H is understand that it is equal to the uh, coefficients for your reaction uh, for each of those substances. So whatever when you're given, if you were given oxygen, you would use 17 instead, or whatever. So. Um, yeah. Alrighty, so um, make sure, last little bits here, make sure you have Proctorio installed and all that, uh, and that, you know, it may be a good idea to take the practice quiz again right before you take the exam, just to make sure everything is working so you don't start your exam time uh, while doing that. Yes, always remember to balance unless it's a redox thing. Question. Um, yeah, so just take that other one real quick again. You put in a bogus answer, who cares, just to make sure everything is working for you. Uh, and then go ahead and take the exam. 
All right. So, um, of course, if other questions uh, come up, feel free to to put them. The homework is going to be due Sunday at midnight. The key will post um, one minute later, so you'll be able to see that Monday morning. Um, so you can uh, have a look at all of those. <laughs> Alrighty, well, uh, in that case, yeah, yeah, don't worry, that's not what I'm worried about. So, yeah, unless your kids are feeding you answers or something, or the dogs are giving you answers, then we have a problem. But, yeah, other than that, that's fine. Okay. Take care, everyone.